So good afternoon to all of you. You know, so once again I welcome you for this lecture. So morning, uh, you know, we have started our uh, lecture on artificial intelligence, and of course I have told you, you know, all the important steps. So why we artificial intelligence is required in here because the data is increasing, you know, huge amounts of data we are getting. So obviously, you know, this artificial intelligence is popular, and then artificial intelligence is very capable. Actually, you can explain the large amounts of data with less number of unknowns and with less uh, error itself. Okay. So that is the main advantage of this, uh, you know, the neural networks. Okay, I have shown you this NGA and all other uh, things I've already shown you in the morning uh, this itself. Okay, so now I will just show you like the same things. Uh, recently, you know, we have just slightly updated our networks, and then we will go to the deep neural network. Okay, so this was a New Zealand database. Uh, the, all these databases are available in the public domain. So you go to that website, you take that flat file, you will get this data. Okay. So here also we try to do the same thing only like um, whether it works NGA West, it was uh, quite superior. No, some other uh, database also whether it works or not because NGA West when we got those interesting results, you know, so it may be a chance also. So same thing you have to prove it for other databases. So we took just this uh, New Zealand database to show that it is uh, efficient actually. So these are the some histograms I already showed you, you know, in the previously also. Generally, whenever you have any data set, so you have to do this uh, histograms or skewness, you know, kurtosis, you have to plot and show that they are not Gaussian, uh, then, when, then only, you know, neural network comes into picture. So these, the distance and magnitude and others I've shown you. And these are some data sets, okay, the recording time history set for this, uh, you know, the New Zealand, some Christchurch uh, earthquake actually. And another thing was uh, the beauty of this earthquake is, uh, you know, the many of the time history set. Uh, you know, for six magnitude also, they have exceeded 1G actually, 1.32 like that, you know, we get extremely high uh, values itself actually. So PGA, you can see extremely very high value for six point magnitude also. So this was the reason why, you know, we took this uh, earthquake actually. So now anyway, this already I showed you like, you know, the, the complex and other things also. So now this is what we did. So in inputs as already I showed you, so magnitude, then, uh, you know, this distance RJB, R up log RJB, then VS30, all those things have been taken up. And then uh, here, what we have done is, uh, you know, now response spectra is one thing which is widely used in the design. Okay. Now, apart from response spectra, say, now people, uh, you know, research, they want some more per terms actually, like, you know, PGA, PGV, PGD, PGV by PGA, then significant duration, predominant frequency, central frequency, shape factor. So this we call as a first order parameter. Then we have RMS value, RES intensity, you know, CAV, acceleration spectrum intensity, velocity spectrum. So all these things are uh, required, like third order say, where you go into three dimensional uh, thing kind of a thing. So all these uh, parameters are now required for engineers actually. So like for example, if you are designing nuclear power plants, say, the shutdown, you know, when the nuclear power plant has to be shut down. So that depends on CAV actually, okay? And if you are working with landslides or liquefaction and other related things, say, so some other parameters will be very interesting, like areas intensity, you know, all those things, you know, they are linked to variety of these uh, issues also. So what we try to do was from the time history data set, we estimated all the parameters and then we used a neural network actually to predict these parameters also apart from uh, response spectra itself, okay? So this is the first order parameter. Like, you know, if I have the data set, just to take the peak value, you know, like the peak value of the data, this is the first order parameter we say, like max absolute value, then PGV, then PGD you followed, then duration and other things you can estimate. Then uh, from the frequency, so you can find out, you know, the maximum frequency, that is a value at which it is a peaking actually, okay, the maximum this one, then PGY by PGSA. So this automatically is linked to this FP itself. So the ratio predominant frequency we estimated, and then, you know, this uh, four and amplitude spectra estimated. After that, you know, you compute response spectra also. Then area under the response spectra say from 0.1 to 0.5 second, they say it is a spectrum intensity, you know, then VSI velocity spectrum intensity. So all these things have been uh, estimated actual. Okay, so these are all the parameters which are, uh, of course, for an engineer to design a structure, we require only response spectra. But if you want to do liquefaction, landslide analysis, nuclear reactor shutdown or whatever, so other parameters also are widely used in the uh, practice actually, okay? So all these parameters have been estimated from the data. Then the third order we say, that is evolutionary power spectral density we say, okay? So this is a little bit advanced, but uh, you can easily follow. 
So it is like you know you have the amplitudes on the z-axis, you have on the y-axis a time, you also have the uh, frequency also. So it is something like much more advanced actually. So polar amplitude spectra will give you only frequency versus amplitude. Here it is you know how this frequency versus amplitude is evolving in time. That will be given by this evolutionary force spectral density. A lot of methods are there, wavelet techniques, silver to Wang transforms, Wigner will many things are there. We used this HHT actually, Hilbert to Wang uh, transform, you know, to extract this evolutionary power spectral density also. So the advantage is you know at what time which frequency was acting. It is something like an additional information we get from the uh, data. So all these uh, parameters have been estimated for the New Zealand uh, database actually. Okay. And then uh, these are the correlations actually, how these uh, parameters are correlated among uh, themselves, you know, because PGA may be correlated with PGV, you know, so all those things have been estimated. And finally, the network has been developed. The same network only, whatever I showed you pre previously, the mixed up regression. So inputs are, these are the inputs, magnitude, then a distance, log 10 R. So it is something like a radial damping. Then another one is, uh, you know, analytic damping, we say. Then depth to the top of the rupture, this one, then log 10, then uh, focal mechanism, then I think uh, T indicates that uh, where it is located, you know, that also. So all those things have been estimated. And as already I told you, uh, if you don't know the inputs, say you can include all the inputs and then uh, you can compute the sensitivity and then, uh, you know, if the sensitivity is very less, you can delete that input also. So you take all these inputs and these are the outputs actually. So this is for, uh, you know, the PGA, PGV, PGD and then, uh, you know, all other parameters. Now, this is another network, say, so which you can estimate only the uh, response spectra actually. So two separate networks have been done and hidden layers, you can see here you have one, seven, and here we have four. So this is this is what we call as a hyperparameter sexual. So how many hidden neurons have to be there, say? So as already I showed you, random search, grid search, Bayesian search has to be done, and then you will get these uh, numbers also. So compute everything, and then you run the network, you know, and then finally, uh, you have to show these uh, plots. These are mandatory, you know, so the bias plots, we say. So you have to show that they don't have any pattern with respect to all the input uh, parameters itself. So you get these visual plots also, get the visual numbers also for PGA, PGV and all other uh, parameters itself. And if they're all of them are near zero, say, that means, you know, your network is uh, very good and, uh, you know, it is able to capture the patterns in the uh, data. So that is how we, you know, classify, uh, we evaluate our uh, network actual, okay? So this also is inter-event residual, I already told you. Because in earthquakes, the main problem is, uh, you know, three magnitudes will be felt only small distance, but uh, nine magnitude will be felt up to large distance. So as magnitude increases, number of records also increase. So they are correlated actually. But generally in regression, they should be uncorrelated to handle that one. You know, we do this inter-event, intra -event, that mixed effects regression you do, and then you plot both of them, show that, uh, you know, they are very, uh, there is no bias or there is no pattern in this uh, numbers itself, okay? So, and finally, so these are the response spectra sector. So, you can compare this with the data and with our uh, neural network model. So, you can see this is a Christchurch earthquake. So this line is the data, okay? So, and you can plot our uh, network also. So, the developed is in the blue color actually. So, it matches very closely to all the international equations like Bradley's equations. So it is valid for uh, New Zealand, you know and some other NGA yeast equations, if you plot. So this our uh, neural network say, it is much more close to the data, less number of unknowns and less, uh, you know, the standard deviation. So not only for the response spectra, even for all the parameters also, these numbers have been, uh, you know, got these numbers. And finally say, so these are the sensitivity plots actually. Okay. So these are sensitivity for the parameters, okay? And then sensitivity for the spectral acceleration parameter. So you can say which is the most dominating here? No, which is the one which is highly influencing the inputs? Uh, can you see this graph? Read these numbers and tell me. Now you can type in the chat box also if you want, okay? So which is the most important parameter? No. Yeah, magnitude, very nice, okay. The next comes is the distance log 10 R actually. So 24% is controlled by this one. The lowest is the focal mechanism. This is a tectonic thing that T stands for, okay, 7.23. So you can see, now when it comes to the spectral acceleration, say, 
So magnitude is 26%, log 10 is 22.87. So you can easily identify. So the tectonic thing is much more higher than, you know, controls the frequency content rather than this uh, parameters also. So this way, uh, you know, we have, uh, you can use the neural network to find out that it works very well for response spectras. It also works very well for the ground motion uh, parameters also. Okay. So this work is also available, you know, the online. Okay. So same neural networks here, two networks actually, which we have developed one for the parameters, another one for the uh, response spectra also. Okay. So, so these are the, you know, the shallow networks, you know, which we have developed. So now we will go to the deep neural uh, network actually. Okay. So I will just share my this thing. Yeah. I am sharing my next uh, this one. Okay, visible is it? Uh, slides are visible, right? Yeah, visible, sir. No, uh, visible. Okay, so fine. So now the first uh, morning set. Just we have finished shallow neural networks actually. Okay. So now we have discussed, you know, how the shallow means only one hidden layer only. That's all. Okay. So and we have seen how to do regression analysis. That's what we also call this a supervised learning actually, because supervised means, you know, we have a, you know, the basis that is the objective function. Okay. Then we have the algorithm also that is, you know, uh, Levenberg mark data algorithm or whatever. So that comes under supervised learning. And of course it is a nonlinear regression. So now let us see this, the second portion actually, that is much more advanced, you know, nowadays, uh, uh, this is, you know, people are using right now in the research, uh, this one. So that is what we call as, you know, the deep neural networks actually, okay? So we will be discussing, you know, these things, NLPCA, then auto encoders, LSTM, Bayesian neural network, and GAN, general adversive networks, CNN. I will just show you just uh, some few of uh, them itself, okay? Just few things. And the main thing also we're discussing about is, you know, this dimensional reduction, uh, dimensionality reduction actually, okay? How to do dimensional reduction using our uh, neural network itself. So we will be discussing both the supervised and unsupervised learning. I will tell you also, okay, where which is supervised and unsupervised. See, like for example, GAN said it is unsupervised uh, learning. So, so we'll be discussing all those things actually, okay? So now the thing is very simple actually. See, like now, uh, you know, this is a Japan database. So as already I told you in the morning, in Japan, say every, you know, a few meters actually, uh, full instruments are there. You can see full Japan is uh, instrumented. Even in our India, in the IGP region also, you can see the networks are huge actually. So many instruments are operating at the uh, same places or huge uh, data set is uh, available. So the instruments are located actually. Now this is, uh, you know, like this is example I'm just showing you. One more thing is with respect to, you know, this is a principal component analysis also. Like if you have the rain gauge stations which record rainfall, in India also we have so many stations have been put up to record the uh, rainfall itself. Now similar, this problem is same as our, uh, this one also. So many instruments have been put up in Japan. Every 10 meters, every 50 meters you have put up an instrument. So now the question comes is whether uh, that much, uh, you know, things are required, you know, if, whether we are putting more number of instruments or, you know, we, we can do the same information with the very few stations itself, you know, like how many stations are required actually. See, like in, in Ganga Basin say, at every place you have to put the instrument or you can put at every thousand meters or how do we handle this, info, this thing also. And then the advantage is if you put instrument at every 10 meter resolution or whatever, whatever, so the number of instruments increases. And when there is many earthquakes, say, the data also increases actually. So the same earthquake you will be recording at all these stations, like 2011 Tohoku earthquakes almost, you know, because instruments are so huge, more than 1000 or 1500 uh, things have been recorded actually, okay? So too much of data is also is a headache sometimes. So too much of data, too much of information actually, okay? So finally, we will look to, it leads to confusions actually. 
So how do we get meaningful information? So it is something like same earthquake only you are recording at many stations, okay? Because the earthquake is same. So why that much the information is required or you know whether we can reduce the dimensionality? That is a question you know which we are asking. Like in India also, so if there is earthquake in Himalaya, you know, so all these instruments will record. If there are 300 instruments, you will get 300 records actually. If there are 1000 instruments, you will get 1000 records. Now the question comes, you know, the earthquake is same only whether uh, 300,000 or, you know, whether that much uh, thing is important. And if you have 1500 or huge data set, then, uh, you know, too much of data is also a headache for us actually, because you will be doing all duplications only. Same thing would have been recorded at, uh, you know, many places or whatever. So we have to remove this information and it is very difficult for us to understand this large dimensional data. So the question what we are asking is, uh, you know, uh, whether how do we group them actually? So whether we can group them or you know reduce the dimensionality, that will be easy. So like you know there will be similarities in the data and too much information. So it is very difficult to handle and the duplicate things will be there. And uh, you know instant once we have grouped them into several groups or you, if we can classify say. So it will be very easy for us to understand. So instead of uh, you know studying each and every station say. If you group them and if you know the group uh, properties, you know, it is very easy for us to understand this uh, information. Okay, so this concept is same as uh, you know a CGPA, which we use in the classes. If the class has 120 students, say, so understanding each and every fellow is a problematic. So what to do? We you know conduct exams. We group them. Say, if you know that that student is very intelligent group or something, then you can give a you know uh, you can help him in that fashion or whatever. So that is what you know we are looking for. So you want to, too much data, you see, little data is a headache for us. Too much data is also a headache for us, actually. It's very difficult to understand. So what we try to do is, so we identify the clusters or you group them and you finally, the idea, idea is you reduce the dimensions, dimensionality. See, if there are 1000 records, you say, that means, you know, 1000 dimensions you have. So if you have recorded this earthquake at 1000 uh, stations, say, you did, so your data is having 1000 dimensions, actually. Okay, so the idea is instead of thousand dimensions, can I reduce it to some uh, three or four or maybe ten or twenty dimensions? That is a question you know, which we are asking. Or you group them into some groups, actually ten groups or twenty groups, then it is easy for us to understand what is happening and what you know we are going to get, what this data is going to tell us. Actually, so this is our uh, the concept of this dimensional uh, you know the reduction. Okay. Uh, so now the same thing say even uh, you know for the earthquakes also if you see all the epicenters okay now of all past earthquakes of all over the earth say if you plot all the epicenters they look like this so the size of the circle indicates the magnitude like yellow one indicates nine this indicates eight you can see lot of uh, things are there so something around you know, 50,000 earthquakes or maybe 1 lakh earthquakes would have occurred in the last 100 years. So now the question what we are asking is understanding each and every earthquake is a problem and 1 lakh earthquakes means 1 lakh dimensions actually. So whether we can reduce the dimensions, that is you group them into some 10, 15 groups or whatever, then it is easy to understand. So that is a question you know we are going to uh, ask actually. So reduce, uh, reduce the dimensions. So how to do this actually, okay? Now that is what we are asking here. So now uh, even the Burj Dubai, say morning I showed you, like, you know, every floor instrument they have put up, say whether that is really required, you know, 120 floors are there, say 120 data sets you give me, and you also give, you know, broadband data, axillogram data, global displacement data, that data, this data, that data, say. So finally, what happens is, you know, so much of data, and uh, if you want to understand patterns, it becomes very difficult actually, okay? And the memory is also very high. So if I can reduce the dimensions, reduce the duplicate information, if I remove from this and take only the you know, specific information, it will be easy for us to understand. So that is the concept, you know, it will, we are asking. And the advantage is if you do that one say, then the decision making and others becomes very easy. So that is a concept behind this uh, dimensional reduction actually, okay? So now here, what we try to do in our, uh, you know, the data analysis, the simplest linear analysis we say. So this we call as, you know, the principal component analysis actually, okay? So this is essentially reducing the dimensions only, but it is in linear fashion, okay? This is what we call as a PCA or the principal component analysis. So this was one of the statistical techniques, you know, widely used uh, to reduce the dimensionality. It was started in Pearson, you know, 
there are some books and uh, things are there for principal components. It is very easy, uh, which is linked to our eigenvalue, eigenvector actually. Even in mechanics of materials, say, if we know the stress matrix, you know, stress is a three by three matrix. So nine components are there, say. and of course, symmetry means six components will be there. So what we do in our, uh, you know, this analysis is in our, uh, you know, our mechanics of materials or structural mechanics. So this stress matrix, say, we find out eigenvalue, eigenvector actual. So that, uh, so the six components, you know, so this is reduced to three dimensional space. Okay, because only we are having three principal stresses and among these three also we take the largest one actual okay one dimension so six components so you can reduce it to one dimension or three dimensions based on the eigenvalue eigenvector so same concept is used in uh, principal component analysis also okay which is widely used to reduce the dimensionality but the assumption is it is perfectly linear type of uh, you know the analysis itself but only thing here is uh, to do this eigenvalue and eigenvector say we use this uh, covariance variance matrix so if i have data say okay so you find out the covariance matrix uh, you know of the data it's that is nothing but the correlation and other things also so i hope all of you know this uh, concept of variance and then covariance so these are just a measure of the spread actually how much they have spread over a set of points around this uh, mass center of mass itself okay and of course variance means measure of the deviation from the mean for points in one dimension so this is what we say variance covariance means you know it is basically a measure how each of the dimensions vary from the mean with respect to each other i hope all of you know this is a covariance variance you would have already you know computed for other type of problems also so now uh, covariance of course is measured between the two dimensions so to see if there is any relationship or whatever you know so covariance between one dimension and itself when you take the covariance of uh, the data with itself automatically you will get the variance also okay so this is what we try to do so this is the data set you can see the data originally it is plotted in x1 x2 dimensions actually okay so at each point say we have uh, x1 comma x2 okay so this is the data basically so the data is you know every point has two attributes actually one is x1 other one is x2 so the original data is two dimensions yeah so what we try to do is we try to find out the eigenvalue eigenvector of this covariance matrix and you can easily find out from the data and then you rotate them, and then you find out the eigenvector say so these are the eigenvectors actually so you can see so this is y1 and this is y2 actually okay so these are the eigenvectors so now if you rotate the coordinate system say now you see the data in this coordinate system so how the data is looking like uh, how many dimensions it has originally if you look at an x1 x2 coordinate system it has a two dimensions now in y1 y2 coordinate system say what is your comment uh, so all the points are scattered around which direction only See, originally it is a two dimension it is scattered very well in the x1 and x2 also but after you rotate the coordinate systems along y1 and y2 uh, now you tell me in which direction is uh, what is the dimensions or which direction the variance is high hmm. you can type in the chat box also you know when you rotate the coordinate system what is what has happened to the data hmm. So variance in y2 direction, what has happened? Scatter you see in y2 direction. No. So this scatter, if you see in this direction and the scatter in this direction, say. Now, what is your comment? No. When which direction scatter is high? Along y1. No, along y1 actually. Now, if it's in the original coordinate systems, in original coordinate system, scatter was high in which direction? No. So this was the original coordinate system. So if you see x1, this is x1 actually. Now x2 is, uh, you know, this to this actual, okay? So this is a scatter in the original, this one. So x2 and this is x1. Now, after you rotate the coordinate system, say, okay? So now what has happened? So we have just, uh, the this one we have normalized. So now you can see this direction, the variance is very, very small actually. So this is very small. Uh, so now if the variation is very very small say what can, what is your comment whether the data has a two dimensions or one dimension itself
Well, what is your comment in Y1, Y2? Y1 has is very large. Y2 is very, very small actually. So now you, what is your comment? Yeah. The data is a 2D or 1D? Yeah. Yeah. You can approximate the data is how many dimensions right now? Yeah. In Y1, Y2 coordinate system. Yeah, you can type even in the chat box also, you know. Yeah. It is something like your principal stresses there. You have calculated first principal stress is 100, you have got. Second principal stress you have got as, uh, you know, one. Uh, what you will do? See, first principal stress is 100. Eh? Second principal stress you have got as 1 MP or whatever, say. Now, what you will do in your analysis? Yeah. This is sigma 1, this is sigma 2. Hmm. You will consider 1 also in your calculations, the second principal stress. Yeah. Which is more important, you know, in the way when you do the design 2 by 2 stress matrix, you have, okay. So you have done the eigenvalue, eigenvector. You have got the first eigenvalue as 100, second eigenvalue as 1 actually. What you, which, which one is more important for you? Sigma one. Uh, sigma one only. So now initially the problem is a two dimensions. Of course, now also problem is a 2D, but what has happened was one is higher, the much, much higher than the other one. So you can neglect the second one itself. So same thing here also. So now the scatter along this direction is so huge and scatter along this direction is very, very small actually. So what you can do is, you know, you can neglect, uh, you know, the Y2 itself actually. So originally the scatter in X1 direction, scatter in X2 was uh, almost comparable. But after do, you do this eigenvalue eigenvector analysis, you can reduce the dimensionality. So from X, so two dimensional data set has been reduced to one dimension set. So this is the concept of, you know, the principal component analysis. Same as your uh, principal stresses, principal strains, whatever you have done. So if you have the data set, only thing is there you do work with the stresses, but here you work with the covariance matrix. So you just extract the covariance matrix of the data and then find out eigenvalue, eigenvector. And, uh, you know, easily you can find out. So when you do here also, it will be like this. First eigenvalue will be, you know, some 100. Second eigenvalue will be 2. Then the other one will be 0 0.10, 0 0.001, like that you will get it. So the 90% if it takes the top 2 or the top 1 itself will be sufficient actually, okay? So that is how we reduce the dimensions. So this is what we do. Now here also, uh, see, this is basically a three-dimensional data. You follow so three dimensions. So each point has x, y, and then z actually. And now, uh, what is your comment here? No. So this is originally the data is in three dimensions. Now you do eigenvalue, eigenvector, say. So that is anyway we are calling this as a PC1, PC2, PC3. So this is my coordinate system actually. And now the data is in how many dimensions? No. Originally it is 3D. After you do eigenvalue, eigenvector, what has happened to the data? No. So how many dimensions finally it has? See this figure, how many dimensions it has? Uh, three dimensions actually, okay, so two dimensions. So now finally what has happened? So PC3 said is almost uh, zero, zero kind of thing. See the length of the arrow also indicates the variance. So the length is high means variance is also high. So PC3 is very, 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 very minor actually. You can neglect it. So finally from 3D, we have come to two dimensions actually. That is the idea here. So here also if you see the data, so here originally the data is a two dimensions actually. Now after you eigenvalue, eigenvector analysis, you can see this direction, the scatter is uh, you know very, very small compared to this scatter actually. So here also, so 2D has been reduced to one dimension actually. So this is the concept of principal component analysis. So the reduction in the dimensions actually, okay? Uh, so now that is how we see that. So this, you can just compare. So if you have the data say in linear regression, what we are trying to do is we are trying to fit a straight line to the data actual. So you will find out error, you know, like this, and then, uh, you know, you find out the straight line. Now in principal components, it is essential eigenvalue, eigenvector analysis. So what to do is you don't fit a straight line. You rotate the coordinate system actually. So you can see 
the coordinate system itself you have rotated uh, theta you know one degree two degree three degree like that you rotate such that in one direction variance will be very high other direction variance will be very very small actually so pre ca is essentially there is no you know you are not fitting any straight line or you are not fitting anything only thing what you are trying to do is you know you are just rotating the coordinate system such that you know the variance in one direction is high other direction it is small actually to reduce the dimensionality you can see the error is you know you can see you are trying to you know this is a perpendicular to this line set this is what essentially you are going to do here actually okay now linear regression means coordinate system is set the coordinate system is you are not rotating the coordinate system simply you are fitting a straight line that means you know you are max minimizing this error actually in pca you are not fitting a line but you are trying to rotate the coordinate system such that one direction variance is high other direction variance is small actually so this is the difference between regression and then uh, pca so in pca we are not interested to fit a line but we are rotating the coordinate system such that you know the dimensionality is reduced actually now the same concepts in nonlinear regression also instead of fitting a straight line you fit a curve actually but the concept is same so you are maximum minimizing this error only now this is what we call as a nonlinear principal component analysis or sometimes nowadays this is also known as auto encoders actually okay so these auto encoders is same so this uh, you followed it. So you have these auto encoders here. So now here also what to try to do is, you know, you try to fit a curve actually, okay? So this is a curve, you know, we are trying to fit to the data, whatever here. So this is a curve, but here what we are trying to do is we are not fitting a curve essentially. So you are trying to, so here in the linear analysis, the principal plane is a straight line actually. So here, this is a principal curve. So this is a principal curve basically, okay? This is a principal plane, like eigenplanes are principal planes, okay? So this is a principal curve we fit to the data such that, you know, the variance in one direction is high, other direction it is very, very small actually. So this is how we try to do this one. And the same thing is also known as auto encoders actually. Nowadays in deep learning, you know, this is the concept here, okay? So now I will just show you PCA analysis and then we will go to nonlinear PCA. So same problem with the earthquake epicenters say. So now I want to do the classification or you know the clusters or whatever I want to reduce the dimensionality say. So I compute all the energy here. So I have zones actually. So already people said that you know the whole zone. So zone 37, zone 8, you know. So like this we have the zones at this entire portion. So these many zones are there. Now I want to club all of them into similarities or into groups actually. So I have, we have taken each group and then computed the energy or the epicenter or whatever with the time and then did the PCA analysis say, the time series at one station, two station, and then, you know, so we compute this analysis. So finally we group them into this one set. So now you can see, so this is one group I have put in same color. So the India boundaries, so this Indian plate, this one, more or less, uh, you know, it is this uh, Eurasian plate, this boundary here. They are homogeneous actually. So although there are some 37 zones or whatever uh, are there in the entire, uh, you know, this uh, earth, but all of them can be classified into, see, this is one group and you can see the black color here. So this entire region say, these are all same actually. So this is also same, this is also same. You can see all of them are homogeneous actually. They behave in a uniform, uh, you know, fashion actually. Just you calculate the earthquake energy in each zone and then, uh, you know, you just make the covariance, variance and all other things you do. And then you group them based on your principal eigenvalue, eigenvector analysis itself. So finally, your 36 uh, things say they boil down to, you know, some four or uh, five groups only. So that is means you have reduced the dimensions also. Not only that one. So now if you want to understand this plate, say it, this plate also behaves same as this itself. So you can easily understand, you can group them, you know, the analysis becomes very, very simple actually. So these are principal component analysis helps you in reducing the dimensionality of the data actually. Okay. Now, same thing uh, people have tried, uh, you know, previously for rainfall, uh, you know, long back, you see, uh, Iyengar, Basak, there was one classical paper was there. So these are all the rain gauge uh, stations are there, say. So at each station, we have the rainfall state, uh, you know, the data. So they have done the principal component analysis. And finally, you know, they have divided them into some interesting, uh, you know, the groups. So these are all one group here, the homogeneous region. So these are all one group, 
one group, one group, one group. Like like we have we do grading in the class, right? S grade, A grade, B grade, all the students say. So we group them into one group. So now once you have done the grouping, say, so you know there are like 163 stations are there, say. You can club them into you know some uh, five or six groups. Then it is very easy for us to understand you know the, all the other uh, details actually. So that is the beauty of principal component analysis and the concept of dimensionality reduction actually. So we have done, I have shown you the linear analysis. Same thing you can do for seismic data also. Like I already showed you for India, you know, the PESMOS network, we have the data for all these uh, past earthquakes also. So here also, these are the list of earthquakes actually, which have data, all the data is available in the public domain in the PESMOS website actually, okay? So in the PESMOS, then Cosmos website are there. So you can go to these websites, you can download the data also, okay? So all the records are there. So now for all the records, you say there are something around 320 or maybe 400 uh, records are there. Now as all and these, they have come from variety, variety of magnitudes, variety, variety of distances, variety of site conditions, variety of this one. So here what we are interested is, I don't want to develop a neural network to predict all of them. I want to reduce the uh, dimensionality. So these are 328 are these ground motion parameters say, can I reduce the dimension? That is the question which we are asking actually, okay, through linear analysis. So these are the data sets, okay, the histograms and other things also. So we've calculated all the ground motion parameters, which I showed you in the previous, I showed you for New Zealand or whatever. So first order parameter, second order parameter, third order parameter, say. All those things have been estimated actual, okay? So now all these, so now the here the problem is when you look at these parameters, say, you can have uh, earthquakes, you know, you can have time history, say. So for one earthquake, PGA will be high actual. For the same, uh, if you integrate, say, PGV for another thing will be higher, then PGD will be something higher. So some earthquake uh, areas intensity will be higher. For some uh, data, say, VSI will be higher. So you will have a lot of clarity, you know, problems actually. So the thing comes, which time history I should use in design and which time history will give me the maximum uh, damage actual. So this is what we wanted to understand from this uh, data sets. So what we did was, uh, so you compute all the parameters. These are all the attributes actual, okay? PGA, PGV, PGD, V by H, predominant frequency, precentral frequency, something like 28 uh, parameters are there. I showed you, you know, the previously also for New Zealand. So you estimate all these uh, parameters, you say. So now that means for each uh, strong motion record, each record will have 21 attributes actual, okay? So it's like a 21 dimensional space. So now we want to reduce the dimension and then we want to find out which uh, time history is the most damaging for our structure actual. So these are the correlation coefficients. Many of them are intercorrelated among themselves. So now, uh, you know, you have 21 parameters. So say magnitude also is there for that record, uh, hypocenter, then PGA, PGD, all of them are there. So now the question is for this matrix, you, know, you have to just find out the eigenvalue and the eigenvector actual, okay? So such that, you know, the knob diagonal terms, you know, will be almost will be zero. So now you find out and you can calculate PSO. So finally, it turns out to be, so 24 uh, dimensional space here. So finally, if you reduce, 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 you know, finally it appears that only, you know, six or seven itself will be sufficient to explain the data itself actual, okay? So you can compute all the parameters and then you can see. So like, for example, so up to PC9, okay? So up to if nine dimensions, it means 90% of the data say will be explained by this nine itself, okay? That means a 24 dimensional space is not required. Nine dimensions itself we can reduce also. And you can find out all the PC1, PC2, PC3 also. And then if you plot them, say, so nicely you can group all these parameters into three zones. Automatically PC1 versus PC2, if you plot, you can see PGA, RMS value, ASI, VSI, PGV, PGD, CAV, EAC, so all of them nicely, you know, they will be very close to each other. So you can say they are in one group actually. Then you can have another group also, that is V by H, this, uh, this one yeah, energy, frequency, predominant frequency, then duration related parameters, so all of them go into another group actually, okay? So beautifully all of them, if you do analysis also, sir, physics also you know, automatically comes. So these are all amplitude related parameters. They all come into one group and these are frequency related. And these are duration related parameters. So which says, you know, you are uh, 24 dimensional space. You can reduce it to three dimensions, actually three groups or whatever, you know, we can say also. 
and then you can easily identify with this uh, pre principal components also you can plot the data and then you know you, you can find out as a distance is more so that damage that uh, record is more damaging to your uh, structure also so this also you know some distance amplitude parameter which, which we have derived and then so this analysis will help you to select a time history so let us say you are having 300 time histories are there one time history has a high pgi another time history has a high pgv another time history has uh, some predominant frequency will be something else another time history has duration is high so which one to select in your design say so you have to select a time history which can maximize the damage to your uh, structure actually so for that identification you know so you can use this principal components and you can classify the time history say okay in terms of damages so this is essentially uh, classification problem dimensional reduction and you can classify in terms of damage So, and then you can use a time history, which will give you more damage. And then you can do your uh, analysis. So, so, generally, you know, most of you will be doing fragility analysis, vulnerability analysis. Say. So, if there are 1000 time histories are there, say, okay. So, whether you have to do analysis for all the 1000, not required actually. You can do a preliminary analysis like that. And whichever has the highest capacity, say, in principal component space. So, you can take the time history and then you can use your vulnerability or fragility or other type of uh, analysis also, okay. So this work is already published also. So this paper is available and uh, you know, if you want more details, you can go ahead and you know, read this paper itself. And now we have seen linear regression in the morning. Nonlinear regression also we have seen. That is a shallow neural network. This also we have seen. Now PC also we have seen. That's the linear analysis. Now let us go to NLPC. That is your auto encoders and others also. Nonlinear, okay. So the concept is same. Dimension reduction only, but with the neural networks. Okay, with N. So this is known as NLPC, but uh, this name was given long back actually, in somewhere around 1980s. But now uh, people, they don't call as NLPC, they call this as auto encoder actually. Okay, so this is the name, you know, right now, uh, in deep learning, so they use this uh, to reduce the dimensionality. So this is essentially extension of linear PCA to nonlinear. So this is what we call as the auto encoder or uh, NLPC. So same concept is same. So they also known as auto encoder, and it comes under uh, deep learning or a deep neural network actually, because you know the hidden layers will be more, and uh, you know the, uh, the more number of unknowns and the complexity also increases actually. Okay, so the concept is very simple. So we want to just reduce the dimensions, nothing else, in a nonlinear fashion. So what we do is very simple actually. So this is a network how a typical auto order or you know your NLPCA looks like actually. Okay. So what happens here is uh, you know so you have the inputs here. Ah, so you have the inputs here x1, x2, x3 actually. So these are the inputs here. So now you have a hidden layer here actually. Okay. So now you have one layer. This is known as our PC principal component or sometimes bottleneck layer also they call okay so once again you have a hidden layer and once again you have output layer actually so here what we are interested is we are not interested in forecasting or we are not interested in the predicting so we want to reduce the dimensionality of the problem itself okay so what we try to do is so input is x1 x2 x3 actually so hidden layer anyway you will be having so this is my pc1 okay then output is also x1, x2, x3 only, you followed. So this x1, x2, x3 approximated from this one. So the concept is, so initially the data has a three dimensions, okay? Now I want to reduce this three dimensional data to one dimension only. So this is my principal component. And how good is this reduction to know that one say? Once again, we, you know, so from, so, so this is what we call as extraction or, uh, you know, de encoding or whatever. So now in this first portion, you have reduced the dimension set. So from three to one, you have reduced actual. Now here, what you are doing is decoding essentially. So from one to three, once again, you are uh, generating the data, original data from your PC. That is your uh, load from, so from high dimensions to low dimension, now from low dimension to high dimension actual. Okay, so the input is also da your uh, data. Output is also the same data. Inputs and outputs are same actual, same X1, X2, X3. But here in this problem, we are not interested in the input. 
or we are not interested in the output also. We are interested only in the bottleneck layer actual. Okay, so how many neurons are required in the bottleneck layer? And then, uh, you know, so what is that bottleneck layer? The principal components are. So this is what we are interested in actual. Okay, so this is the dimension reduction. So three dimensions, so we are re re reducing it to one dimension. So in NLPC, what one does is, you now here 3D to 1D. Then you can do 3D to 2D also, okay? So which one is efficient, you can calculate and all those things have to be done. So this is essentially like this. So this is our data set, these are all the blue lines. So this is my principal curve actually, like a principal plane because it's a nonlinear here. So we call this as a principal curve. So this is my principal curve actually, which passes through the, uh, you know, the data itself. Okay. It is not regression. Okay. As already I told you, this is a principal plane, but since it is nonlinear, we are calling it as a principal curve. So this network is very, very simple. Input is X1, X2, X3. Output is also X1, X2, X3. But what we are interested is we are interested in the bottleneck act. That's the reduction of the dimension. So that is what we are interested actually. Okay. So this is what we are interested. UV is our interest. So input is X, output is also X, but of course it's approximated. So that's why we are putting as X dash and these are the hidden neurons actually. So now this is the expression for a hidden neuron say. So this, uh, you know, it comes with the input things. You add it up and then you take that sigmoidal function or something. You will get the output at the hidden nodes. And from that say, you will calculate U. Okay, that is this bottleneck layer or your principal component actually. Now, once again, what to do from the bottleneck layer, once again, you calculate the hidden uh, this one and once again, you calculate X dash actually this one. So now what to do is you find out the error between X dash and X actual. So this is my objective function. Okay, so objective function is the data with the data only. The data, whatever is the input, output is also this one. So like if input is response spectra set, output is also response spectra only you followed. So how good is the approximation? Since the problem here is now, can you tell me how many unknowns are there here? No. So this is a three, this is a two, then you are having one, then once again two, then once again three say. Uh, now can you calculate how many unknowns are there? Any of you can tell me, like in the morning, whatever we are. So can you tell me how many will be the number of unknowns? Eleven. Somebody has told, but uh, check here. How many unknowns are there between this to this? Three twos are six actual. Okay. Plus two into one. Uh, then once again one into two. Plus two into three. You follow. So six plus uh, two plus two plus six actual. Okay. So two six plus six twelve. Twelve plus two fourteen. Fourteen plus two sixteen actually. Plus you are also will be having bias actual. So one bias here, one bias here, two biases here, two plus one, three, four, five actually. Five and then six, seven, eight biases are there. So 16 plus eight actual. Okay. So how many are there total now? Almost you know, 24 unknowns are there. Uh, you followed. So 24 unknowns are there in our model actual. Okay. So now since the number of unknowns will be very high, say in these uh, nonlinear principal components or in these auto encoders, what to do is some regularization, we do smoothening of the uh, data. Uh, so we add some, some constraints actual so that we will get some good uh, results itself. So now you find out, uh, you know, the weights to say, and then biases such that, you know, this is uh, minimized actual. Okay. So the same level bar mark data or, uh, you know, any genetic algorithm or whatever say. So you can use it and you can find out this uh, weights. And finally, our interest is in the value of U actual. So this is what we are interested. We are not interested in the input. We are not interested in the output, but this bottleneck say, this is our principal component actual, the dimension. And the objective is from 3D, we have reduced it to 2D actual. So generally what we try to do is there are several uh, ways are there. So this problem say you are having 3D to 2D actual. Okay. So you do for 2D, then 1D, 3D, you would do a lot of, uh, you know, iterative kind of a fashion to find out, you know, these reduced uh, numbers also. And then we also invoke like, you know, this bottleneck neurons, so the first one and the second one, they are orthogonal to each other also like eigenvalue, eigenvector that also we enforce and then we find out these uh, numbers itself. So this is a concept of you know the principal uh, the nonlinear principal component analysis. So it is same as uh, PCA only, but PCA is a linear, but NLPCA is nonlinear. Now here also NLPCA, these functions are all sigmoid functions, sigmoid or tan hyperbolic views. 
tan hyperbolic or sigma add actually okay but if you do in nlp csa instead of using tan hyperbolic and sigma it's a if you use linear terms actually now what happens uh, instead of tan sigma or something if everything is linear connections you say uh, then what happens this collapses to hmm. So these activation functions, we will not use sigmoid or tan hyperbolic. We will use only simple linear equations, say. So like this F1, uh, this is no F1 actually. So directly you can write H as WX plus B itself, okay? So there is no tan, uh, tan function or this one. So it collapses to what? Yeah. So what happens to NLPCA? Uh, you can type in the chat box also what happens if everything is linear linear connections so no non-linearity what happens hmm. it collapses to what no. see we, if, if everything was linear connections so what happens no. finally the results will be same as no. Uh, perfect. It is leads to linear. That means PCA only. Nothing else. You followed. So it comes to principal components only. Because of non-linearity, it is NLPCA. That's all only. Okay. So now the uh, unknowns actually. Already I told you. So if M is the number of hidden neurons. Say, L is input data size. You know. So this is the formula actually. Same only. Because this, this both of them will be same. Because there is a symmetry right in the network. So two. 2LM plus 4M plus L plus 1 actual. Okay, so that is the main thing. And because the number of unknowns are more, obviously nonlinearity will be high in this network. So, you know, apart from this, we also have to use some uh, smoothening uh, constraints and others actual, okay, to make the network, you know, uh, doesn't trap in the overfitting or something like that actual, okay. Uh, so now that is the same concept, say. So that is where, you know, this deep neural network or whatever. It is also same the uh, NLPCA and others you followed, right? So this comes actual. So the same thing say nowadays, as already I told you, people don't call this as a NLPCA, they call this as auto encoders. Uh, so this is the word right now, which is widely used right now. Actually, nobody calls this as NLPCA. Okay. But theoretically speaking, you know, so NLPCA was a term which was 20 years back. Now that name has been changed to auto encoders, but the philosophy is everywhere same actually. Okay. And of course, so so auto this is why this is called as auto encoder. This is also called auto encoder, or this comes under deep neural network actually. Okay. So why the reason I already told you in the morning, shallow neural network means only one hidden layer will be there. But NLPCA, what is happening? You can see several uh, one hidden layer here, one hidden layer here, inside also one bottleneck layer. So since you are having many hidden this uh, things, uh, we call this as a deep neural network also. So NLPC is known as auto encoders also. It comes under a deep neural uh, network itself. Okay. So the concept of auto encoders is same actual. So you have to reduce uh, you know the dimensionality of the data itself. Okay. So you can see. So the data is uh, there. Say. So this is our uh, data. So you can see six dimensional data is there. So now you have to reduce it to three dimensions actually. So six. This is the three dimensions. And of course input and output are same but the bottleneck will have three you know the unknown sections so these are concept of auto encoder same as nlpc also so that to compress the data to reduce uh, better than pca uh, you followed but it is a better than pc because pca is a linear okay so on the same data say if you do pca you may be able to reduce it to like six dimension data set if you do pca you may be able to reduce it to five dimensions only but if you do nonlinear PCS or auto encoders, you may be able to reduce still further and you can go up to three dimensions only. That is the philosophy here. And there are a lot of papers also recently I saw in, uh, you know, when they have a 60 by for a structure, say, okay, this was for a frame structure in some six story building or whatever, they had 195 uh, degrees of freedom actually, okay. So they used the auto encoder, you know, to suppress this to some three or four dimensions itself, you know, this paper is also available. Uh, like you know the frequencies mode shapes they gave 195 or huge this one and finally they were able to reduce it to you know very few dimensions actual and they reduced these parameters they are nicely linked to the stiffness parameters okay and then they are linked to they were able to explain you know the damages and other uh, you know things also uh, so these papers are available you can uh, you know see in the internet also now anyway coming to our earthquake data set so what here we are trying to do is so now this is a response spectra okay 
Uh, so now response spectra, so how many frequencies are now response spectra? You can compute for any natural period you want actually. So now X axis goes from response spectra zero to infinity. And there is no bound actual on the response spectra uh, because response spectra is a response of a single degree of freedom system. So uh, you know you can go from zero to infinity. So now how many time periods are required say? So like either a 28 will be sufficient or 100 are required or you have to find out at every you know 0.1 second or how many points are required actually. So this is a question actually to define the response spectra. So how many points are required or whatever you know. So this you have to find out actually. Suppose if you had 1000 points say then uh, you have to develop a shallow neural network. So your output neurons will be 1000 actually. So if we can reduce the dimensions, you know, how do we handle this in the in the, this case actually? Okay. So and of course, response spectra are highly correlated actually. So the if I take spectral acceleration at this time frame frequency say, and if I take at this frequency, they will be nicely correlated actually. But of course, as you go far away, then the correlation uh, decreases. So this is a value you can see the response spectra at 0 0.01 second and response spectra at far away. So the correlation will be 0 0.5. But when you come to close, automatically it will be 0.95. So they are highly correlated among themselves itself. So now this is auto encoder which we developed. Or NLPCA. Ah, so now you can see. So total how many 91 uh, you know the response spectra we have taken. That means 90 spectral acceleration at 91 periods actually. Okay. So PGA then 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.022 like that, you know, up to four seconds actually. So these are our uh, response spectra. So total there are 91 are there. So now the idea is if I develop a shallow neural network, say, I have to take 91 output neurons actually. So the idea is can I compress the dimensionality? So this is a typical auto encoder which we have used. You can see 91 and eight hidden neurons we have taken. And finally, so this entire thing has been reduced to three pieces only. So you can see, so from 91 dimensions, say we have been able to reduce it to three dimensions. Yeah. So can any of you tell me the how many number of unknowns are there here? Uh, if you have a calculator, say in your mobile, you can compute and tell me how many unknowns are there in this uh, network. Hmm. So how many number of unknowns are there? Just calculate, try. So it is very easy to that formula also I showed you very no need to remember the formula you know so you can directly calculate actually. Now you can type in the chat box also if you want okay. So I am also calculating, okay, 91 star, right? Yeah. Now, how many unknowns are there? Any of you have calculated? Yeah. Tell me. Roughly also you can tell you can type in the chat box. Uh, see any of you have given yeah, the new numbers. So ninety one eight three eight ninety one. So you can easily calculate to see 8 into 3 plus 3 into 8 plus 8 into 91. Okay, these are the weights. And then you have biases 8 plus 3 plus 8 plus 91 actually. Yeah, so how many any of you have got the answer? Uh, 15 not 4, 3 not uh, Zimbabwe has given. Okay. Uh, you just verify. Okay. So I think it turns out to be 91 into 8 plus 8, 3. 
plus 8 plus 91, something around 1600 it turns out to be. Okay, so you just try. Okay, it's very simple. Okay, because we have to include biases here, bias for this, bias for this, bias for this actual. Okay, so these are the extra 8 plus 3 plus 8 plus 91, but this is how the weights you have to calculate it. So these many unknowns are the huge, uh, you know, the network. That's why we call this as a deep neural network because the number of unknowns are extremely high. We have to impose additional constraints also. Okay, so fine. So this is how you know it turns out to be. So you can calculate uh, you know these numbers and these are the tan hyperbolic now 1620. Somebody says okay, fine. Uh, you verify okay. So around that much only we will get the numbers okay. So now uh, f1, f3, these are the tan hyperbolic functions you do and you can see PC, JC. So our PCs are this one okay. So in the network say we are not input is same, output is also same, but we are not interested in input and output. We are interested in the bottleneck layer actually. So these are our reduced dimensions actually. Okay. So there are a lot of, uh, as I already told you, because the number of unknowns are high, say we use this Lagrange multiplier, we use this lambda and other uh, details also. Okay. And now these are the things you know we have one has to verify also. If I do two dimensions, say how much will be the error? 3 means how much is the error, 5 means how much is the error, because from 91, you know, with a 10, like, you know, we increase actually, okay? So, like this, P now we have shown you 3, we do with 1, then we do with 2, then we do with 3, then we add with 4, with 5, 6, 7, like that, you know, the hyper parameters already I told you. So, all these things you can verify and you can check how good is the thing. So, like if you see recorded data is here, say, now this is with the 20 pieces actually. So, 20 pieces, what happens is 20 dimensional space. So the idea here is uh, error will be high, small, but it will give a lot of oscillations actually. Okay, it is not required. Then finally, with the two PC or three PCs, uh, you can see they give nicely, you know, the data. So they are able to can easily control the data itself actually. Okay, so that that's how you know we take these numbers into calculate. So finally, three PCs are the one which we are going to use in our analysis actually. Okay, so we find out R value and others. So you can see with the two PC, three PC, five PC say. Now, which is the best? Yeah. If you see the R values, R, uh, you can see the sigma also. Uh, how many dimensions it is? Hmm. You can see from this so 91 dimensions, okay? So how many dimensions we can reduce? Three or two or five, 10, 15 or 20, which is the lowest? Yeah, it's Yeah, you can type also. You see which is the lowest PP, R value, sigma value, PC, say, which is coming lowest. For which pieces it is coming? Uh, lowest for which is for what it is coming. Yeah. Can you see here? Uh, lowest is coming for? You can see 20, it was 0.35. Yeah. 9196 997 998. Now, if you see PP value, say it is high. If you see sigma also, three PC is extremely high actually. Okay, so this way you can tune your hyper parameters also. So now the idea is now once you have reduced the dimensionality of the problem sex, now you can develop another simple neural network act. Instead of predicting the response spectra, you predict PC1, PC2, PC3 itself. Actually. Okay, it is something like two step actually. So here you once again you run a neural network, you know. Now then this neural network is uh, you know uh, separate. So you are having output as a PC1, PC2, PC3, and the inputs are same actually, which I showed you in the morning. And now any one of you tell me how many number of unknowns are there? No. no. How many number of unknowns are there in the network now? Say five inputs, five hidden, three outputs. Now, part eight, excellent. Morning, how many was there? You remember? Morning, the same network I showed you, but output was spectral accelerations actually. Uh, you remember? I don't know how many of you remember. I think we had 198 actually. Okay. So, from 198, we have reduced it to 
of course we had that auto encoder weights also that's a different issue so you can see the same problem say you first uh, reduce the dimensionality and then you run a neural network also so with 48 unknowns you know your network works very beautifully so you can see all the residuals are you know almost close to zero because you have reduced the dimensions and you know the inter event intra event whatever i showed you in the morning so all of them are uh, you know much much closer to you know the zero itself and you follow it so you can easily you know you can calculate it so you can see this was the original model actually okay the morning model i have shown you the present model say uh, you know you can see the standard deviation slightly higher only but uh, the number of unknowns here it was 198 now here it is you see 48 actually you follow so this is how and more or less you are also able to get the same uh, you know the you can get the same accuracy with less number of unknowns itself okay so this is how the nlpca or your auto encoders will help you to reduce the dimension and once you have reduced the dimensionality say you can make the problem very simple and then you know you can go back actually so the idea here is so you use this network you find out pc1 pc2 pc3 and once you know pc1 pc2 pc3 you substitute here actual in this network so this portion we take that is the you know decoding kind of thing so once a pc1 pc2 pc3 rather you substitute here you get back your uh, spectra actual and then you do all the calculations so it is like a two way two stage problem actual okay one network is for a reduction of dimension other network is to predict the reduced dimensions here itself okay that is how we try to do and of course, this also works, you know, if you compare with the data, you know, that original model, this model say. So this also works very nice and, uh, you know, the reducing the dimension and then predicting those PCs, it works fantastic and it also gives more or less very good results and, you know, and if you do hazard analysis say, so you also will get, you know, confidence and, uh, you know, the nice values with these numbers also, okay. So this work is also, this paper is also available in uh, Journal of Earthquake Engineering, you know. So if you want to know more details, say, okay, so I will be sharing with Kalyan and you can, you know, of course they are available in the web itself. So you can just see this uh, articles also, okay. And now uh, we will see one more uh, application of, you know, the same auto encoders for the New Zealand database also, okay. That is how to predict the Fourier spectrums actually from the synthetic time histories to New Zealand itself. So here also the concept is same neural network only. So now here, instead of working with uh, response spectra, so we try to work with the four amplitude spectra. Both are same only, not much uh, difference. But the advantage is for four amplitude spectra, so you can generate the time history easily. But whereas if it is a response spectra, so spectrum compatible accelerograms are little uh, complex actually. Okay, that's why we try to do for Fourier spectra. So here also the concept is same as auto encoder actually. So you take 108, okay, the, this data was already there. So 108 dimensions we have. So this 108 has to be reduced to small dimensions actually. Okay, so this is our auto encoder. So you can see this is 108 here and uh, you know you have 20 hidden nodes okay and this is 108 so you can see the number of unknowns are very high actually so it is something like 108 into 20 plus uh, 20 into 108 plus biases actually 20 plus 108 okay these many unknowns are there in auto encoder so we reduce everything to 20 dimensional space using a auto encoder actually and then we develop another network say so which can predict this 20 you know the numbers actually one two three all the 20 this one so once this network predicts this one so we go back actual okay so we go back and then we give our uh, predicted things from the network and then we will generate the uh, output data set itself okay so these are how the we couple auto encoder with a shallow neural uh, network actually so auto encoder is a deep neural network and this is a shallow network Whereas this is a deep neural network, okay. So we combine these two and we try to get some, uh, you know, very nice results. So you can see seven hidden 20 outputs actually, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. So you can calculate the number of unknowns. So seven into seven, seven into 20, plus you have biases, seven bias plus 20 actually. So these are the number of unknowns actually. See, so if you want to do directly the data say, then this will be 108 actually, okay? So then the numbers will be very high, seven into seven plus seven into 108 will come into picture actually, okay? That is advantage of 
combining auto encoder with this uh, you know the shallow neural network itself and of course this model also you know it works very nice and uh, you know it works fantastic with uh, when you compare with the data it uh, compares much better than the predicted ones the, the conventional equations and you can get reliable results with this uh, database itself and these are and if you plot so whether physically you know whether these Fourier spectra are physical violating you know so for that you see you can plot this also so you can see uh, as magnitude uh, increases say the low frequency portion should increase actually okay so this is a physics tells you okay low frequency will amplify the high frequency will not uh, be amplified actually because you know as magnitude increases say the length and width of the fault also increases so the low frequencies content will increase actually now this also for strike slip 100 kilometer this one for variety magnitudes you can see all these nice uh, you know the plots which are physically also they are very meaningful actually such which means that the network say the whatever results it is giving are physically perfectly fine actually that is how you know you have to interpret them now the same thing say if you do for uh, 5 magnitude 10 kilometer if you plot you know the physics is not getting uh, you know the violated actually so you can see uh, this is a rjb 10 5 magnitude 10 then uh, this is i think this is a 5 magnitude 10 kilometer and these 100 kilometer actually okay for 7 magnitude it is so the physics is perfectly you know the it doesn't violate the physics at all actually okay and now once you have done the Fourier amplitude spectra side you can easily calculate time history you know like it just uh, a typical Fourier transform assuming phi is random. So this you know G of F actual. So this you will get you will get from the neural network, okay, the amplitude at that particular frequency. So you take phi as a random set from minus two pi to pi. Sorry, minus pi to pi or zero to two pi or whatever okay so you generate this in the computers as a random variable and then you substitute here and then you know you multiply by envelope function you can get a time history like this actually okay from our data so this neural network is something you know if i give magnitude distance if i give vs30 and all other uh, details you say so it is something like you know if i give magnitude all the inputs here i will predict uh, these you know auto and uh, decoded values and these values I will use it here and then I will get my four amplitude spectra. Once four amplitude spectra is done, say I will simulate a time history. So this is a simple uh, combination of deep or so shallow neural network to simulate a time history for a given magnitude, distance, site condition, and of course tectonic and focal mechanism actually. Okay. And you can generate ensemble, assuming the phase is random. So you can simulate several samples. Their average matches with the uh, then this uh, simulated the, that predicted for amplitude spectra. So you can see these are all the sample simulations. Okay, so you can easily you follow compute all these the time history also. So with very few inputs, so you can simulate entire time history itself. Okay. And if you see from the developed models, from the developed simulated time history, you can compute the response spectra also. So that is in the blue color, say. So it's the blue color, whatever we are showing, is a response spectra, which you have computed from the simulated model itself. So from this, you compute the response spectra, you know, and then take the average. So it looks like this. You can see uh, that this is the one you can see, this station, you know, all the, these are all the traditional equations, actually. But this is uh, which comes from our ANN, and it nicely matches with the data itself, which shows you know, the superiority of this combination of auto encoder and shallow neural network in simulating the time history as well as you know the ground motion itself. Okay. And then we also we compare it actually. So from the this model say the other model which I showed you previously, how good are these parameters also? Whether these simulated time histories captures all those things also. So, which shows that you know it really works in the uh, practice actually. Okay, some few differences are there, but it is able to capture the overall things about the uh, data actually. Yeah. So now that is one aspect. So the auto encoders I showed you how to do use the auto encoders to compress the data and then how to use a simulated time history actually. Now this also is more or less like one more application of this uh, auto encoders where you can simulate a time history itself to say the compressing the time history itself, you know, and then these are predicted things to say you can predict as a function of magnitude, 
uh, you know the distance and then VS 30 itself. Okay, so these are combinations. So original data time history, it will have 10,000 points or 20,000 points will be there. So predicting is a problem. What we try to do is we'll try to do this using auto encoder and predict the time history itself. So this also we can try. So you can see this is an auto encoder, you know, which this was this work was done long back actually in 1999 by the two uh, one professor, you know, he is in University of Illinois. He did, did this long back, but then uh, you know now it has been improvised and people have done. So this is a typical thing. So you can see something like 4096 input nodes he has. You followed. So a time history say it takes a four past four a transform. Real part, imaginary part cell. That is a 2048 uh, real parts, 2048 uh, imaginary part cell. So he does, you see, 4096 to 210, it comes from 210 to 40, then once again 210 into 4096 actually. So this is a 4096 has been reduced to you know, 40 dimensional space. So this is what the auto encoder does actually. But this was a work which was done long back, but uh, this is a 40, how to get this 40, it was not, uh, they did not attempt this work at all actually, okay. So what one does is, uh, you know, what uh, we tried to do was, so the same uh, things, uh, these are 40 things actually, basically whatever we have compressed, you know. So this, if I can predict as a function of magnitude, distance and VS30 and all other uh, parameters, a focal mechanism or whatever. So then we will have a two networks actually. One is a auto encoder for compression, other one is a shallow network. Okay, to estimate these uh, compressed uh, you know, quantities itself, say, and then you compare these two, and then you know we predict this. Uh, you know, we will simulate the time history actually. So this is the concept behind this uh, work itself. Okay, so we tried this also. So you can see this is the original say. So predicted is uh, almost you know close to the original itself, and uh, you can have of course of some stations you don't get good comparison. Some stations it is a network is able to capture this uh, terms also. Okay. So this is also one where you uh, application of auto encoders to simulate directly a time history itself. Okay, so no Fourier amplitude spectrum, no okay. directly we work with the time history itself. Okay. So anyway, so this work is there and the Fourier amplitude spectrum says. So this work is already available in this uh, paper. Okay, which got published I think last year. So this paper is also available in the research gate and you can download. And if you want to know more information, say okay. So you can go through this uh, paper itself. So this is one auto application of auto encoder and combined with the shallow neural network. And now we will go to this uh, LSTM actual, okay? That is a long short term uh, memory. This is also a new network which we developed, you know, uh, to simulate this uh, for earthquake engineering and for other uh, type of problems itself. Uh, see, Kalyan, you are there then. So, shall we take some five minutes break or how? Like one and a half hour, people. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, our next break, we will do, sir, and offer to it uh, to do that. Just maybe because two to five, no, it may be too much, you know. Uh, just five minutes. Maybe. No, five minutes break will take, okay? Yeah. Participant just take five minutes break only and afterwards the star will continue the lecture.
So now just to, uh, I hope you see. Uh, I think I hope you have not lost the track. So afternoon, uh, you know, we have discussed, you understand, right? This uh, principal component analysis I have shown you how to do that is essentially reducing the dimension. OK, so PCA is a linear. Then we came to the NLPCA or we are calling nowadays that as auto encoder actually that is, you know, same as a PCA only, but it is a you know, nonlinear principal component. So it is used to reduce the dimensions. So when you are having a data set which has a huge uh, dimensions, you know, so something like this as already showed you. So like 4000, 5000, so you can easily reduce it to 40 or something like that. So this uh, 40 say, so you can develop uh, another neural network or maybe a linear regression or whatever. So you predict this one and then, you know, you can simulate a time history or whatever variable you are uh, interested actually. Okay. So this is the most nowadays. The people are exploring this in uh, great detail actually. Okay. This is a combination of auto encoders with uh, shallow neural uh, networks. It's a lot of papers are getting, uh, you know, published also nowadays. Okay, so fine. So now the next one say, which is uh, right now, uh, you know, everybody is using or many, of course, this also has, you know, the previous itself is there. So that's what they call as LSTM actually. That's a long short term, uh, you know, the memory network itself. So the concept came from, you know, these auto regressive models. So I hope all of you, you know, the auto regression models we say, like generally in rainfall or whatever say, what to do is we write the future rainfalls or the future data as a function of uh, past data itself. T minus one, you know, T minus two, Y T minus three, like this, you know, T minus four, T minus five, like this, the past several uh, samples you say. So this we call as auto regression. So auto regression means you are regressing the data on itself only. So the past, the future is a function of uh, past itself. Okay, so because the data will have long term, uh, you know, periodicities in the data say. Like if you see this figure, so this peak, this peak, you can see they are correlated actually. Okay, so same uh, duration, you know, the peaks will be linked among the, you know, the correlations or other things will be there. So this is a LSTM is a special type of network say, which also includes, uh, you know, the patterns in the uh, data itself. See the concept of response spectra, which I showed you previously. So initially I showed you how to predict response spectra from the neural network. Then what we have done is this response spectra, so we have reduced the dimensions to three dimensions or whatever, and then we predicted the response spectra. So this is one way, that is one way. So now here, what we are trying to do is, now when you see the response spectra say, so now this also has a nice uh, pattern actually. See, if I see that this spectral acceleration at this period, spectral acceleration at this period, so they may be highly correlated among themselves actually, okay? So this is spectrum acceleration. Says. So this will have influence on this one. This will have influence on this one. So if I can predict this portion, say, so I can use this information say, to predict you know, other uh, time period or other time periods also. So this is the way we are trying to capture the interdependencies among the data also. So the interdependencies we say. Okay. So interdependency of the data say. So this we would like to capture in the LSTM network actually. So you can see all whatever problems I am showing you all are same only. So one way we have just used a shallow neural network we predicted. Next to auto encoder, we compressed it and then we predicted. Now what we are trying to do is we are taking the response spectra. We are not compressing it or anything else actual. What we are doing is if I have, if I know how to predict this uh, spectral acceleration at one second, say we use that information to predict spectral acceleration at two seconds also. You followed. So this way we can the you know the interdependencies also can be established. So this is a neural network LSTM. They say long term memory short term memories of the data if the data has any memory say from the past if it is uh, interlinked or something like that so this network uh, works also okay so these are the weights uh, so on the outputs will be there inputs will be there then the weights will be there so it captures the interdependencies uh, in the data and of course the slow training they say because you know you are taking all the dependencies also it takes time and of course, many parameters will be there, network parameters actually, okay? But still, it captures all the interdependencies and it may give, you know, very less, uh, you know, the standard deviation or this will predict nicely the data has some kind of uh, memory itself. So, this is the concept actually, okay? So, this is how LSTM neuron, uh, you know, the looks like this one. So, we have input data, say, which goes into this one. Then the output data at time, the past data actually, at time uh, J minus 1. 
so it combines actually whatever is the past information because the data is highly linked say okay so these two gates combined and then we have some three gates are there one they say as a forget gate then the input gate then the output gate actually so, uh, so we use this data and then uh, you know we uh, whatever relevant information is from the past say that much only we take actual okay so if there is a relevant irrelevant information say it goes into forget gate and we will not use that information also so we combine these two and then we get this uh, you know the numbers itself so this is a sigmoidal function we use then tan hyperbolic functions also we use and uh, you know we try to calculate the output itself so every time what to do is we also calculate the output also plus what is the information say that's the past relevant information also how much should be used to predict the future data say so that also we calculate from our lstm uh, neuron itself okay so three gates that's what it says so input gate we have uh, this one then the forget gate says so it removes the past into ir irrelevant input suppose if they are not correlated you know so that is not, then uh, if you remove this forget gate then it is as good as your uh, shallow network itself actually so if you remove all the past information say to collapses to ordinary network only but there may be some interdependency so that also we will include in our uh, calculations so it is a little bit uh, complicated uh, neuron you know compared to previous uh, things itself okay so this is how the forget gate they say so you take so this is the weight of the network so h into x h is the past uh, information x is the present information actual okay so you combine these weights and other ones and then there is something like a step function kind of a thing if it is relevant say it goes inside otherwise if it is irrelevant say we neglect that uh, data also then we have the input gate actual so where you know we take this i dot of t you know so same expression only then c bar of t a tan hyperbolic function so which will go as input to our uh, model itself so then we have the weights for the output also. So this also we try to calculate from the output also. And finally, say the output gate, you know, you get this H of T OT into tan hyperbolic of uh, C of T itself. So this is how we calculate this uh, gates actually. The forget gate, then the input gate, then we have then the output gate actually. So how much information the past has to be used, so that much only will be used. And, uh, you know, the network runs, you know, sequential kind of thing for all the uh, frequencies itself. So what we have done here is, you know, so this type of networks were widely used for uh, to predict time series actual, okay? So we try to do this work for the frequency, that is for the response spectra, say. So if there is any interdependency in the response spectra to capture that information also, say, like, you know, if you know the how to predict one second, say, for two seconds, instead of freshly predicting, uh, you know, for two seconds, you use the past information also, and then you link it up to the, you know, your network and then get a better uh, model itself. So this is what we try to do. So this is just a simple, uh, you know, a GIF file, which is available in the Google. So this is the input data, and this is the hidden state or the past units actual. So you take this information, you take this information, like three units are there, two units are there, say. So you take here uh, this information and there are three gates actually. Forget gate, then we have a input gate and then we have this uh, output gate also. So three gates are, uh, you know, we are having. So you take this information, so you multiply and then you take these weights also. So you can see this SS and then, you know, these input gates and then you can see it and then multiply it, addition, and you get the cell state also and you multiply it and then you also get the hidden state units also like that you know you predict both the cell state hidden state and then you it runs on you know sequential kind of uh, network itself so now this also we try to attempt actually so this is a typical uh, neural network you know so we have this a fourier amplitude spectra as actual okay so we wanted to predict the response spectra from the fourier amplitude spectra using this uh, lstm uh, network itself so lstm what to do is the interdependencies among this data also is included in the calculations actually so using this information so there are something like you see five uh, hidden neurons are there so these are all lstm neurons actually they are not like the ordinary neurons or whatever so use this information and then once again you get the response spectra itself and of course they are non-linearly related so finally say so this is our lstm you can see this one so you have you know the information these are all the lstm neurons actually where you know the previous information is also used you know to calculate the new information itself and then we predict this uh, response spectra itself and of course this also works very well uh, you know in uh, practice and when you try to do with the data set so it gives much better uh, results compared to the previous uh, you know the auto encoders and then the previous you know the shallow neural uh, networks itself and as already i told you 
not only the numbers, you have to plot all the residuals, you have to see whether there are any patterns in the data or not. So all those things have to be verified actually. So all these figures have to be made. That is a bias, mean has to be zero. Then there is no trend in the data set. Then only, you know, this goes into the, then the network is superior actually, is how we try to do. And then when you try to plot say, so like four magnitude, five magnitude, six and seven also. So you can see the patterns, you know, nicely, it, all the patterns emerges and the magnitude saturation. So the PGA gets uh, saturated actually, okay? So all those things you can easily verify in the near field. So these is at, uh, you know, so these is at zero, 10 kilometers and this is at 100 kilometers. So you can see all the physical uh, patterns, say how the response spectra behaves with magnitude, how it behaves with the distance, all those things, you know, these outputs are uh, perfectly, you know, fine actually. So now same thing for VS30, how it works is say, suppose if it is a 200 meter per second, 1000 if it is a rock type site, you know, and you can see uh, the same distance, same this one, if I see VS30 200 are in you know, how these response factors behaves, uh, how our LSTM networks say, captures and all those things, they work nicely when you do with the database itself, okay? And then these are some of the plots, you know, to check whether they are perfectly fine or not. So we have like as magnitude increases say, how this, uh, you know, the pseudo spectral acceleration at 0.33 hertz increases. And if it is at 100 hertz, you say how it increases. So we know physically, you know, the slopes will be different, you know, the, uh, spectral acceleration, they vary differently. So all those physical captures, so magnitude, saturation, then uh, change of uh, this with respect to the soil condition, then how they behave with the distance, whatever we know from the physics, our LSTM also more or less gives the same things, which increases the confidence actually in using these uh, parameters to say, okay, in our uh, hazard analysis. So same thing, which we did for, you know, other uh, type of things, developed LSTM with other uh, type of models also, if we check, so the model is more or less uh, consistent with the previous uh, models itself. Okay, so same thing you can do for all the other calculations. And even uh, you can easily, you know, you can pick the pseudo spectral acceleration also. If it is less than 0.25, we have done some study, how much things are required or like that, you know. So this also, it shows that it works uh, nicely in the practice set. Okay, so this paper is also, you know, available online and it has uh, recently published in uh, this, you know, pure and applied geophysics. So this paper is also available from our Google Scholar or even our ResearchGate website. So you can download this uh, articles, okay? So if you are interested in this uh, network also. So now, so that is LSTM. So now until now I have shown you shallow neural network, deep neural network, then the LSTM I have shown you. Now the recent trend is base and, uh, you know, the neural networks are there. So these networks are very special network actually, where the weights, you know, whatever weights you are having say. So you have a lot of options. They are treated as random variables. Or you can say this is something like in you know, a stochastic neural network actual, okay? So this also is a one of the recent, uh, you know, the things which now people are uh, using basically. And here you have a lot of facilities. You can also include the input data set. This also uncertainty also can be included actually. So the input data also, if you know the uncertainties, a lot of uncertainty is there, you know. So that also can be included in the data. And then finally, we can get, you know, the epistemic uncertainty, Elliott uncertainty, or the entire probability density functions, all those things can be extracted from this uh, base and networks. Okay, so these are the uh, things basically. So they are slightly different networks. These are much more advanced, you know. So we have stochastic neural networks, aleatory, all those things. If somebody is interested, say there are a lot of uncertainties, you know. So you can easily you know, estimate from this base and neural uh, network itself. So I will not go into this uh, network, okay. So the details. So if some of you are interested, say, so you can uh, read some uh, deep learning textbooks or something. And we are also writing a paper, okay. We have already submitted for, uh, you know, this review also. Revision has come. Maybe once the paper gets accepted, you know, we will, uh, you know, I will upload in our, uh, you know, website and you can even download that paper also. So these are special type of a network where, you know, you can uh, capture aleatory epistemic uncertainty, which we use in logic trees actually, okay, in hazard analysis. So very simple. So we are not trying to find out weights. We are just trying assuming weights as random variables. And generally we assume them to be Gaussian random variable. We will find out their mean 
and the standard deviation actuator. So these are very special uh, network, you know, which has come, which has become popular, uh, you know, recently in other fields. But in seismology, people have not explored this one. So we are trying to do this. And if some of the some students are there, say, as research scholars, you know, you can examine these type of networks, you know, for our earthquake engineering uh, data, where you know uncertainties are there, even for our uh, structures and other uh, details also. Okay, so this is one of the you know the, the emerging network you can say. Now, another emerging network is a convolution uh, neural network. I think, uh, you know, they have used in safety classification. Of course, these are mainly used for images actually. Okay, so it is something like you have an image. So now you have to do a safety calculations, you know, so this image will be taken by this network and it calculates, you know, all the things and where, you know, this fellow is wearing the helmet properly or not. The best is whether those things are not, you know, automatically it can classify actually. So this is essentially used for classification right now. Okay, so the classification of images, you know, to get some information. So this convolution network has become very popular and the convolution neural network say in earthquake engineering, essentially uh, not many applications or not many papers have come up actually. Okay, but uh, uh, this is also one more, uh, you know, the area for uh, further, uh, you know, research actually. So if some PhDs are there, you can also see how to use this convolution neural network say for uh, ground motion uh, images or something like that. Or this ground motion maps are there, say. Or generally, whenever there is an any earthquake, you know, within USGS, they will send you the shake map. You know, they will send this shake maps, intensity maps, or something like that. So, using these maps, say, if you can do some Google Earth images or whatever, if you can, uh, you know, uh, some classifications. So, this is also an emerging, uh, you know, area of uh, research actually. So what one tries to do in convolution neural network is, you know, you take the input, say it is an image or whatever. So you convert it into a matrix only. Okay. And then uh, you do some kind of a convolution, uh, you know, we have that convolution, you know, in dynamics, you would have studied, you know, convolution operator. So you do several uh, convolutions are there. Of course, they have to be decided, uh, you know, they are like hyperparameters. How many layers have to be there that we have to decide, okay? And then you take the maximum values and then finally say you can uh, classify them actually, whether it is a real or from the table say, which is a more, uh, this one like I showed you, right? This construction practice, you know, so which is more dangerous, you can easily identify from this uh, images itself, okay? So you convert and then convolution, max pooling and then flattening. So these are the words which these computer science people use. Okay, but if you are using in our engineering, you know, because there are not many papers are not there, so you can use those our uh, words and then you can explain this in a better fashion. So that's what they do. So if I have any pixel, you know, we classify into RGB, that 60 pixel kind of a format, and then you do convolutions and then you classify the uh, data itself. So like if you are having, a, this is a matrix, say, the RGB matrix or whatever you have. So this is a convolution matrix actually, okay? So you convolve with this one and you will get another new matrix here on the right hand side. So you do convolution and you get the you know, convoluted matrix itself and then, uh, you know, you extract the maximum values actually, okay? So from this matrix, say, so whatever is the maximum, uh, 119, you can see the maximum values are uh, pulled here. Uh, see, like 119, so 133 is the max, 119, it picks up here, 260. So they pick up all the values here. And then, you know, we reduce the data. And finally, say, I think we will reduce it to one dimension and then, you know, the dense layer or it is converted to an array kind of a thing. And then, you know, we classify them or some decision will be taken based on this uh, data itself. So this is how it goes actually, okay? So you combine all these uh, things to say. So you will get our, uh, you know, the final classification or whatever uh, you want from the data. As I already I told you, so this is also an emerging, uh, you know, area. And there are no applications right now. Uh, you know, if you see CNN in earthquake engineering, so not many uh, research articles are there. So as already I told you for PhD students say, so this, uh, that the LSTM also is only, you know, applications are there, but not much in detail actually. So some of you can explore this LSTM, then basin neural network, then is a convolution neural network say for, uh, you know, this is an emerging area you can explore and you can get some, uh, you know, some PhD students, you can try this uh, numbers itself, okay? So this is what also I think convolution neural network, you know? So these are all fake images actually. 
So this network has been very much successful in uh, image classification. They are not real people, you know, the computer generated images are there. Say. So they are all uh, generated by you know the artificial intelligence. So they are not real person. There is no real people like that. Okay. So we can even design the CNNs, you know, to identify images. But in earthquake engineering, we don't work with faces. Okay. So you can work with you know the shake maps or the finite fault slip images, you know. So so many things are there, say. Or when an earthquake has occurred, you know, from Google Earth, we will get the images actually where landslide would have occurred, like in Himalaya 2011 Sikkim earthquake, say. So many landslides occurred, and you know, it, it was very difficult to identify where damages are more or not. So maybe you know if the satellite takes an image say, of that uh, you know the zone, so from that maybe you know we can easily identify say, which are the regions where uh, you know more damages are there, and this convolution neural networks may come into picture there actually. Okay, so some of the PhDs you can take this as an area of research, and you can try with this uh, CNNs which have a lot of success in the images, we can translate it to our earthquake engineering problems also. Okay, so I will show that the shake maps, you know. So you can try for shake maps. You can try in Google if you type shake maps USGS, you will get these type of maps actually. And then uh, you know Google Earth images say. Okay, after the earthquake. So to identify, you know, the places where there is, a, you know, the maximum damage, you know, where all those things you can do with this convolution neural network with the images itself. So this is one of the emerging, you know, the area itself. Then another network is also, which is nowadays becoming uh, popular. Of course, this extension of the previous networks only, we call this as a gener generative adversarial network, actually, what we call as a GAN, okay? So these also very special type of networks and all these networks starting from your uh, base and neural networks. So this is also stochastic network actually. Okay, so in these networks say we don't work with the data. Data of course, data is an input, but we are not interested in the data, but we are interested in the probability densities actually. Okay, or the PDF or the statistics of the database. So this is what we are interested actually. So this is a, you know, this is a generated, this is a GAN comes under this one. So it is something like this actually. So like this has been successfully used uh, to simulate acceleration time history. So it is some, you have having two things are there. So you are having real samples and you generate this uh, generator matrix or whatever, the noise also is there. So now what happens is, uh, you know, so this is what they say. So it is a discriminator, say two networks are there. It is a binary classification. So this discriminator tells you whether the data is a real or it is a fake uh, data kind of thing, real data or it is a noise actual, signal or noise. And let us say this is a real data distribution is a PR of R say. Then we have a G, which is a generator, which generates a noise or whatever here. So this one, so that's what it discriminator does. And then the generator, there is another network. It maps basically the samples drawn from Gaussian distribution into samples coming from a newly implied distribution actual, okay? So now the, what happens is this generator, it, uh, it, it takes noise, it uh, probability density function, it captures from the noise. And from the data also will have a its own distribution. That is what we are calling as a PR actual. So whatever the generator uh, gives us output, say it goes to the discriminator. Discriminator says whether it is a real end or it is a fake information, or it is a signal or a noise actual. So the discriminator job is so that, so what we do is we train the network such that, you know, the samples which are generated by the network, that's the probability density of this uh, G will be more or less close to real data set itself. So this is how we can generate, you know, acceleration time history or for earthquakes itself. So every training, so discriminator model, you see, we refine uh, this one at each iteration. Uh, of course, whatever samples G has generated, say whether it's a real or whether it is a noise or something like that. And finally, your generator will be able to generate, you know, the exact uh, data itself actually, okay? So these are typical uh, models, you know, recently they have published in uh, BSSA journal, okay? This paper came up. In the recent in 2022, you know, so this is a generator network. 
and this is the discriminator they say okay so you can see the input is random gaussian noise okay and then conditional variables they give like magnitude distance vs30 something like that so after and they, of course they go to a continuous network or whatever here and you have this conditional distribution and then you will get this uh, time history is actually okay now this is a time history is say you give as input uh, and then of course this conditional variables also to the discriminator network actual and then try to find out whether the waveform and attributes uh, come from the training set actual so the original axillograms you have that the probability density is you know so that probability density and this probability density are they more or less similar or uh, different it tries to find out if it is not there say it goes back and says it is a fake and then you see you refine this one so like this you have to do it in iterative iterative fashion such that finally you know your network will be able to generate the real earthquake uh, you know the data itself so this is what we call as you know the generator adversive uh, networks actually so these are the most uh, you know the emerging uh, kind of networks nowadays to simulate directly the time histories itself so this is what they said so this objective function so it is something we write in terms of the probability distribution actual okay so the you take a real data then the distribution of the generator whatever this one so you minimize the weights or whatever you have unknowns in the network such that you know the generator generates the data which is more or less whose probability distribution function is much more close with the data itself okay so this is how you know this network shows and this is a paper which came in 2022 in bssa you know so they have uh, worked on this network uh, and then you know they are the synthetic uh, data they have simulated from the neural network and this is the original data actually so you can see and in this paper they have clearly shown the synthetic uh, time histories even their response spectras polar amplitude spectras and all of them are more or less close to the uh, data itself actually but of course this approach also had a problems you know because uh, you know, if I want to mix all the data, so like nine magnitude earthquake, and we have a six magnitude earthquake, durations will be different, different actual. But these people, you know, they have just uh, limited their only for similar duration, and then they said that this network uh, works actual. But how to do this gone for the entire uh, databases is a still question actually. Now, how to develop? Okay, for the entire database. So this itself is a question mark and it is has to be explored actually okay so that is a, so some of you can take up this type of work also in earthquake engineer for time histories they have done you can use these things even for the building response and other uh, things also a lot of uh, you know, applications are there for this uh, gun also okay so with this anyway you followed right i will just summarize whatever i have shown you then of course we will be having a demo okay done by my of course our phd student is srinath will do a demo for all the things also simple shallow network he will demonstrate so of course in this lecture you know in the morning lectures i have shown you the shallow neural network okay So this I have shown you in the morning uh, slot, and then I have also shown you why we are why AI is becoming popular actually. Yeah. Uh, can any one of you tell me why AI is becoming popular nowadays? Uh, in the morning I told you right. You can uh, type in the chat box. Hmm. So why AI is becoming popular nowadays in earthquake engineering? Uh, what is the reason? You can type in the chat box so that you know I will understand. You understand? Follow, right? A uh, huge amount of data, actually. Excellent to see. So, if you have a large amount of data, say, so AI becomes obviously popular. When the data is small data, say, when you're having a small database, AI is useless actually. The conventional techniques itself are uh, best. So that's what we said. So if there is a small data, say humans, you know, we have our, our ordinary statistic things itself are the best actually. When there is a large data set, say 100 terabytes, more than 1 lakh records or 2 lakh records or 3 lakh records or whatever, then AI will really show the uh, power actually. Small data, 
no way ai will just uh, collapse it is like a fancy kind of thing itself so morning i showed you the shallow neural network and i also showed you why ai is becoming popular and whether it is really there. and of course as already i told you it is it is a in, it is required actually okay so because i told you whenever earthquake forecasting you know to detect the four shocks and after shocks now people are exploring this also even some of you can take it as your for phd you know so whenever there is a major earthquake, say, these four shocks occur actually. So if we can uh, detect these four shocks, say, if your uh, artificial intelligence can detect this, and if we can say that these are all four shocks, you know, you can issue alarms actually, okay? And you can easily predict the main shock and you can do a lot of, uh, you know, interesting stuff, uh, you know, in doing this also, okay? So this is what we showed in the morning. Then in the afternoon session, say, we have started with, and I have shown applications for NGA West also, and uh, New Zealand data. Okay. Uh, this I have shown you in the morning and then, you know, in the starting afternoon itself. So after that, you know, we started uh, discussing, you know, NLPCA. PCA we discussed. Principal components. So essentially reducing the dimensionality. And the linear PCA we have seen, then NLPCA. So NLPCA, same as PCA, but you use artificial neural networks. This is also known as auto encoders. And all these things comes from deep neural networks, okay? So this I have shown you in the uh, today's afternoon actually, okay? So NLPCA, we have said this uh, thing itself. So now after auto encoders and deep neurals, I have also shown you LSTM. Yeah. So these like, you know, the interdependencies in the data. Then of course, I just, uh, you know, Bayesian neural network is there. Then a CNN convolution neural network. Then gone actually. General uh, generative adversive networks are there. And as already I told you, all these are all sophisticated actually. Not many people have published in the uh, literature. So for PhD students, say if you want to do and if you have a large amount of data, made not essentially earthquake data, you can have concrete or you can have whatever building data, or risk database, or anything, say. So you can try some of these networks, you know, you apply for your data and then try to come up with some uh, new, you know, the solutions actually. So this I have shown you. And now other things also I have told you. Nowadays, as already I told you, rotational sensors are coming into picture. Morning lecture I showed you some 200, 300 rupees, say. You can directly measure the rotation itself. So how do we handle this? Uh, we have no idea, you know, in the PCA or even in our neural networks, you know. You are getting extra information. You know displacement also, you know rotation also. How do we do this one? And of developing sensors is also an emerging area actually, okay? As already I told you, if you want to do MASW or if you want to accelerographs, if you buy, it will be 3 lakhs, 4 lakhs. But you can buy that sensor directly from the some of the companies say, which are located in China. They were way, extremely cheap actually. 200 rupees, 300 rupees, you will get it and you can make your own uh, instrument itself. Even the MSW test, you can get it for 1 lakh, you know, if you can ma manufacture on your own, the small, small sensors because they're extremely cheap, uh, you know, nowadays. Even your mobile has a very good uh, vibration uh, sensors itself, okay? That's what you know. Now, of course, small data means we are the best. Large data means, you know, uh, difficult for us, but easy for the computer. So 100 terabytes, 1000 terabytes of data is there. You know, our mind goes, we will not be able to understand what is that data, okay? So that's what we said. Then, of course, in structural health monitoring also, these neural networks are emerging like anything that Burj Dubai, you know. So recently, paper got published, you see, for Burj Dubai, say, uh, they have taken 100 terabytes, a huge database, and they have done, uh, you know, nonlinear principal component analysis and the neural network, and they have shown how to monitor the damages in the Burj Dubai Tower also. You followed. So this is also emerging area. So the neural networks, you know, for structural health monitoring, say. Now in India also, you know, there are some buildings actually, they are, uh, you know, monitoring, like they are putting accelerograph, all other sensors in every floor, and they're going to collect this data. And so how to analyze this data using neural networks is a very emerging area of uh, research nowadays. So for some of the students, a PhD, you know, they can take up this type of uh, work also. And of course, for in, if you don't have the data for abroad uh, buildings, the data is there, share nicely. So the data is available in the public domain, actually. You can look at some of this data and you can try all these variety, variety networks, you know, on this uh, database itself, okay? And of course, in earthquake engineering, you know, your artificial intelligence, machine learning has a lot of uh, applications, actually, okay? In your ground motion prediction, today I showed you only ground motion data only, but you can use this artificial intelligence for earthquake occurrences also. 
you followed. So like where is the next, uh, you know, where the next earthquake is going to occur, you know, you can forecast, you can predict and you can the clustering of earthquakes say this is the emerging area. Clusters, identifying clusters, you know, identifying homogeneous zones and all other things. This is also an emerging area of research, you know, which one can, people are already started using, but uh, these type of deep neural networks, not many papers are there. So some of you can uh, try this one. Now, another thing is epicenter and magnitude determination. Okay. So like right now, everything is uh, linked to the satellite. So once an earthquake occurs, you know, automatically at the stations, you have the data actual. Okay. And immediately, you know, for tsunami warning or whatever. So using the P wave amplitude, so which comes first, you have to estimate the epicenter and you have to estimate the magnitude of earthquake also. Then you can know whether tsunami will occur or not. So the, for that, you see this all, this becomes very important actually, automatic, you know, epicenter and magnitude determination. So how to do this with the help of neural networks actually, okay? So this also is an emerging area of uh, you know the research actual okay so this also one of you can some of you can explore and you can do in detail and of course uh, not only in earthquake engineering in structure analysis and design say now of course nowadays nobody is using neural network they are going by conventional tools only but uh, in the future say you will be getting large amounts of experimental data you know so to identify patterns you see the uh, ANN will have some uh, advantages actually, okay? So these are some of the summaries what I did today and these are the problems. I think some of you PhD who are performing, you know, who are uh, working, if you are interested to do PhD in this area, so it is like a ocean kind of thing. Lot of problems are there and uh, you can do really wonders actually with these uh, neural networks. So now whatever I showed you, all the papers I have shown you, right? Some uh, uh, New Zealand database and you can go to my research gate website actually. Okay, so they, if they are a PhD students, everybody please create account in this website. All my papers, you know, we have uploaded in this research gate website. Okay, I have shown you right that New Zealand database, that soil dynamics, earthquake engineering, journal of earthquake engineering and the papers which we publish recent papers also. There are we update actually automatically this website updates automatically. So you can download these papers from this uh, website itself. Okay. So this you can uh, try. So all the papers are available. So I think with this, I will close. Okay. So if there are any questions, we will take. And then, uh, you know, Srinath will do the demo actually.